All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wakup with Surab. Very happy to be here. Congratulations for the delay. I went to the doctor and I'm happy to say that I'm going to live for at least two more days. Very exciting moment in my life. My new uh, One Punch Man mug also agrees with me. Um, what are the doctors? Very, uh, very exciting moment because uh, I had to go to the doctor because uh, my wife... She told me that I have become too sexy. So I just have to get cured, you know. And this has become a big problem in my whole building. Everybody's just seeing me and they're like, this guy's too attractive. It's become an issue, you know. Everybody just seeing me and they just can't control themselves. And I mean, it's 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 a massive issue. So I just had to reduce uh, some of that. Also, I had a rash, <laughs> which is far less sexy to say that I had a rash. I had a rash on my chest. And uh, I thought the uh, obvious thing, which is that, hey, I guess uh, this is the end for me. Um, I mean, come on, I, I've had skin problems on various parts of my body before, uh, because this is also related to exactly that. Um, and I went to the doc and uh, I knew, you know what, I knew that what, they, what she's going to say, that what you need is Allegra. I knew it before even going. And then she said, you need Allegra. I'm like, thanks, man. Anyway, Kunal Shah says hickey. No, no, it wasn't a hickey. Uh, happy to say that. Uh, Vishal Sharma says, so you can't play the lead in Breaking Bad now. Uh, that was always on the cards, but I'm sure it'll happen uh, someday. Anyway, welcome to the show. Please give a like if you're here and uh, um, so that more viewers pop in because that's how the algorithms work. Um, so yeah, I don't know. People are putting up uh, random things. If you've never seen the show before, I bring on comedians, I bring on friends, I bring on historians, journalists, sports people. We talk about all sorts of nonsense. And uh, uh, today we're going to be talking to Manu S. Pillai, who is the author of False Allies and a bunch of other these things. In about five minutes, I'll bring him on. Um, just uh, we'll take a couple of chats till then. Rohit Rao says, discovered Manu and Moha through woofs to see Manu come back to the show makes it a full circle. Yeah, thank you so much, Saurabh. No, no, thanks to him for coming, man. Okay, it's great. Uh, Shravik Bakshi has an interesting feedback, which is paint me like one of your Nala Sopara girls. Uh, always good feedback, uh, Shravik. Uh, also, with the rains right now, Nala Sopara does look a little bit like the Titanic drowning. Okay, uh, I have uh, one thing to say before I uh, bring on my guests, um, which is that uh, a lot of uh, people have sort of been, for the last week, been sending me uh, messages and telling me to talk about uh, about Samir Raina and his tweets. Um, and honestly, I'm, I'm, gl I'm kind of glad that uh, a lot of you brought this to my notice because I think it was, uh, it was uh, quite offensive. And I'm so glad that people are rallying around and finally coming across to, to the offensive tweets by, by Samir Raina. Um, in case you missed the tweet, uh, I'm pretty sure it was this one. Uh, Samir Aina, this is post the Will Smith thing, tweeted saying, I wonder if uh, at the rate Hanky Pandy's wife has ever slapped his audience member for shouting Eta clear. I mean, honestly, this is this is the kind of disgusting content that, I mean, he really needs to, you know, take a look at himself in the mirror. And the mirror will look back and say, you know what, Samir, delete the tweet. Um, I mean... First of all, bringing my wife into this, I mean, come on, that's completely uh, horrible. And also this eight are clear, non I don't know, listen, to quote Vipul Goel, I'm a senior comedian and you must respect senior comedians. Uh, and this eight are clear nonsense, I don't know, people are very respectful at my shows. Uh, they're very kind. Uh, when I enter the show, people actually scream, his holy highness hi is here. Um, so I just find this uh, extremely shameful and uh, Samir Aina should apologize in public and in private to himself uh, and his conscience. Um, and yeah, and look in the mirror and he'll find Tanmay standing behind him. So just, I mean, uh, this kind of, this kind of um, tweets, uh, it's, it's, it's horrifying to me. I think this is, I mean, I'm, I, I'll probably file defamation cases, uh, at least four criminal defamation cases against uh, Samir Aina. Uh, disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Comedians should know the limits is what I'm trying to say. I think, I think comedy is funniest when there are limits. And I think everybody should know that, that comedy is really funny when you have different uh, social um, backgrounds tell you what you can't talk about. So, I mean, uh, just disgusting, horrible. I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I, I've, I've been hurt about this for three weeks. So thanks a lot for Twitter for rallying across to my cry. Okay, last thing I'll say before I continue, uh, I have a book out called Vote for Punt. You can check it out on Amazon. It's a lot of fun. And if you've already read the book, re leave a review. And um, this weekend, I'm going to be in Bangalore doing shows at Jagrati Beautiful Theatre in Whitefield and in uh, Hyatt Centric uh, on uh, on Sunday. Uh, Jagrati is on Saturday. Tickets are selling very fast. 
I think 40% already sold out. So please get your tickets fast. It's going to be two hours. I'm doing a show called Worst Show Ever, which is about some of the worst shows I've ever done in my life. So come check that stuff out. Um, it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. And uh, tickets are on saurabhpanth.com. And uh, yeah, I'm coming after that to Kochi, Vizag, uh, Calcutta, Bhuvaneshwar, Mumbai. And they're early bird tickets, which are cheaper than the normal bird tickets. So get them now because they sell out pretty fast. Okay, that is about it. I have spoken enough nonsense. Be quiet, you migate. Uh, okay, I'm going to bring on my guest. He's written about, I think, 12,000 books probably this year. I don't know how many books this gentleman writes and what kind of research he does. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot to take, okay? Uh, his new book is called False Allies, published by Juggernaut. Ah, shut up, you phone. God damn you. Ah! What is this, man? Hey, my phone's been hacked. You know what? It's, what the hell is happening? Okay, that was some pornotic stuff. Okay, his new book is called False Allies. It's uh, centered around uh, the very famous painter Ravi Varma, who I knew very little about. And then I read this book. I've read 97 pages so far. It's available for 130 rupees on Kindle. Um, he's a Sahitya Kala Academy Yuva Puraskar winner. My God, we have to find out what that is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, put in comments, uh, enjoy and all those things uh, for Mr. Manu S. Pillai. Hi, Manu. Good evening. Hi. But it's great to be back, by the way, and and you're wearing a great T-shirt. I felt a little, oh, you. Like, you know, subdued compared to your clothes while you were talking. <laughs> Sorry, I had to, I had to, uh, you know what? I had a few things I had to talk about and get, just get get off my chest, so I just did that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I I followed that online. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, how's it going, Manu? How's things? Going well. I mean, I'm I'm sitting and finishing up my PhD thesis. So it's been a lot of work, a lot of writing, a lot of um, you know sleepless nights. Uh, you know where, where even your dreams are about footnotes and and characters in your thesis and you know things and the arguments you want to make and so on and so forth. But still, it's a it's a strangely rewarding process in its own way. You know, right? if you if you have a way of romanticizing lack of sleep, this is one. Yeah, it's also uh, you're doing a thesis on what? Kerala history because I worked on Kerala in in the colonial period for at least 11 years now. So I thought might as well, you know, like get a formal degree in that. Okay. So uh, see, there's a couple of things I have to ask you. What, what, what is the qualification for Sahitya Kala Academy Yuva Puraskar? Is that... Firstly, uh, it's not Sahitya yeah. Kala Academy, it's Sahitya Academy. I think Kala is yeah. like the, 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 the performing arts. This is the, the yeah. literary one side of, of things. Uh, I don't know if there are qualifications. They give it out to, to writers. Uh, there's, of course, the main Sahitya Academy Award, which is given to writers who've really established something, uh, a reputation for themselves and done stellar work over a lifetime. You know, so very, very established figures. Uh, my, my, my ex boss Shashi Tharoor, won it a couple of years ago, for example, after writing some 20-something books over, over a period of 30, 40 years. Uh, in my case, the, the award I won was the one for writers under 40, I think. Uh, that's, the, that's the upper age limit. And that's given to these, in quotes, young writers, uh, every year in, in different Indian languages. So I got it for English for my first book five years ago. So it's been a while. Uh, that's the only, only reason I will not win. I just turned 40. I mean, that's why they've not been considering me for this particular year. Otherwise, I was I was a shoe in I was a shoe in for it. Well, you've written a book now. You could ask somebody to sort of, you know, pass on the message, get, get your book noticed. Or I could just have my own award shows. Okay. Um, this is a, I have a comment coming in from Shavik uh, Bhakchi, uh, who says, are those trophies yours, man? So all the trophies no. behind you, are those all yours? Actually, they aren't. I mean, my, mine are kept in a different room. This is like my, my office space. And these are my late father's various awards that are sitting here. He was a teacher. So, you know, he ended up collecting quite a few over the years. And I've got a picture of him in that corner. But these, because, you know, these are large, like, there's no place to keep them. So I've kept them yeah. in the largest, uh, the, the most like uh, perfect space to keep these largest trophies. Okay, so let's let's get down to the the history aspect. The very very interesting book and the center is the sort of I like the 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 way you've tied it uh, tied the whole thing in, which is of course uh, like I I don't understand art as is evident by my comedy, but um, like uh, Ravi Verma painted a, a bunch of I think there's forty maharajas of whoever he painted, um, and so what we could try and focus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, and so I had I had a couple of questions. It was I'm just going to try and focus on some little tidbit things that I read in the book, um, and we'll talk about those so that people have uh, no spoilers essentially as 
as such so the first thing i want to talk to you about is there's a there's a line in your book where you said that i think the last nizam of hyderabad uh <laughs> had a habit of picking up stubbed cigarette uh, uh, cigarettes because he was a miser so i have two questions okay two part question where do you find this out and what else was he miserly about and what are the other sort of instances of people being miserly because with with maharajas and stuff like that, i think you spoke at length about uh, about how uh, uh, i forgot the the kingdom the uh, travancore was called something yeah. kilam but uh, yeah kilimanu that's where we are now born yeah correct yeah and they how they ran out of uh, out of out of funds because they were spending so much money on on all sorts of things uh, so what are the ex- other examples of like maharajas or maharanis or whoever being misers well miserly the, so uh, the bit about the nizam and his cigarette stubs is one of these apocryphal tales that uh, that popped into this famous book called freedom at midnight that came out if i'm not wrong in the 60s and it's a bit of a sensational book like there's a lot of claims in it which are which are fairly sensational uh you know about uh, some maharaja it claims that every year he had a procession where he went out stark naked with an erection and like wearing jewels only or something completely false because i nobody's ever heard of such a procession it doesn't happen <laughs> anyway uh, in in the present time so it's somebody you know created the story and decided that oh this is an exotic enough story about a maharaja as a class maharajas were considered exotic anyway so you know it was it was one of those stories the nizam was a miser he was somebody who was a bit of a penny pincher even though he was one of the richest men in the world the story goes that you know one of the biggest uh, you know gemstones i think a ruby or a diamond or something was found sitting in a sock in one of his drawers he used another famous gemstone as a paperweight uh, he at one point feared communist action in his state and apparently in his basement had trucks ready to sort of you know leave at that you know immediately at, at an order and these trucks were full of gems and gold and pearls and all kinds of valuables again a lot of this could be apocryphal we know he was a very rich man we know he was fairly miserly uh, but you know the, the british had this habit of sort of adding a little bit of masala to these stories just to make it look like these maharajas were all idiots and they were all these eccentric figures who were just doing eccentric things all day long and that actually had a bit of a political agenda you know it was a way of saying that acha these guys actually don't know how to do these guys are actually no good so let's just make these colorful stories around these people because in a sense it infantilizes them it makes them look weak it makes them look stupid it makes them look colorful so they're also entertaining at the same time which is not to say that they weren't entertaining you know politics then and now is entertaining even now we have mlas locked up in resorts some of them trying to climb the walls and escape and all that in 100 years from now people may be like did this really happen you know so there is comedy there is entertainment in yeah. all political settings to that extent they could be entertaining but a lot of this is also masala you know bits about how when the british resident visited the nizam he would give him what half a biscuit and a cup of tea and then you know one of these stubbed out cigarettes which is just not possible it is it is simply not possible that that's how the british resident was received there were protocols for these things you couldn't just receive the the viceroy of india's Uh, agent with half a biscuit and a cup of tea and a stuffed cigarette that's not possible <laughs> yeah that's why i think you mentioned that it's like this is based on on, on sort of on sort of new rumors and and all of that uh, that kind of stuff uh, yeah. by the way there's uh, this is a uh, sort of fun uh, feedback to this whole thing which is that uh, kunal shah says uh, maharaja should be allowed to get into that friday mode uh, mm-hmm. which is basically the the erection uh, allegations <laughs> against whatever it is <laughs> i mean the erection uh, allegation is still sort of you know one can still vaguely picture okay maybe there was some religious right that required the raja to be naked just you know except for his jewelry but yeah. you know there's a bit uh, and you mentioned it in your social media post yesterday or you hinted at it about how they at one point the the british in the late 19th century accused the raja of having romantic feelings for elephants again that was i mean that's such a scandalous kind of claim to make <laughs> yeah. that the scholar who cited it and he's seen the actual papers i've not been able to track it down but there's a scholar called edward haynes and he refers to this in one of his uh, one of his articles but he doesn't give you the exact source or name which maharaja this was about because he thinks it's such a wild story and it's so obviously <laughs> false that it would be liable to publish something like that to claim yeah. that somebody's ancestor you know had a had a love affair with elephants is not yeah. uh, i mean a lot of people like elephants but i don't think that means my own great great one of my great great grandfathers had two elephants but to suggest that this involved any kind of romantic feelings would be a bit excessive yeah and i mean i, I mean without getting into into any uh, I, this things of bestiality and consent and all the kind of stuff also biologically 
bit of a challenge i mean i'm just saying like you i mean <laughs> yeah it's it's a bit of a challenge without even all the ethics involved in it um it so you said that that was yeah uh, that was going to be my next question about that okay um uh, nikhil limaye has asked this question 12 times so i'll just put it up uh, when will false allies be available in the us not any time soon because you see i've not so far bothered very much about publishing abroad now i'm quite happy yeah. publishing in india but the way these contracts with publishing are done is you do it by geography so you assign uh, you know publishing rights to one company in the indian subcontinent another one say in europe and another one in say america another in australia that's how usually it works so i've only bothered so far to like publish in india because i don't see uh, much of a need to sort of do it abroad my next one will be because that's already in the contract but yeah yeah my book is just got my my publishers have got international rights because nobody wants to buy it anywhere else so they are just like we'll take international make sure best of luck with selling it international you you should have negotiated against that you should have held on to it you never know you know yeah. today in today's world there's no guarantee when maybe 10 years from now someone will show up and say look uh, we're interested in That's carrying true. this uh for you so you know why why give away rights you know in any way if you think nobody is going to buy it still keep the rights no why do you want to give it to somebody else yeah that's true okay uh, there's there's uh, there's one uh, line which also struck out to me now again just to sort of uh, do you want to give a two liner on the book just so people have an idea and then i'll just get into what my couple of questions about it more yeah i mean the the book is called false allies because you know we have this idea that the maharajas firstly they were playing fancy dress all the time Uh, you know they wore crowns they wore lots of fancy jewelry they wore silks all the time they were constantly partying drinking champagne whatever you know that kind of image of the maharajas as playboys and just lots of beautiful women in chiffon sarees and pearls then there's the other caricature that these guys just stood by and did nothing when india was taken over by the british and that they were in cahoots with the british you know they were sort of pillars of the british empire they sort of sided with the british and therefore uh they are essentially villains of the story you know so we have the nationalists fighting the british but the nationalists and gandhi ji and sardar patel etc also wiping out the the princely states and that's how you know new india was born but the book argues that that's a very simplistic uh, way of looking at it you know the the princely states are very important pieces on the political chessboard uh, as late as the second world war you know they made major contributions to fights against the, the fight against fascism for example the first world war they did not in fact uh, ally with the british mindlessly there was a lot of give and take there was a lot of needling of the of the british as well in fact for the longest part of the pre- freedom struggle for decades the princes were actually pro nationalist and the nationalists used to get a lot of financial backing from the from the princely states it was only in the final 10 15 years that the relationship soured so in reality i'm not saying the rajas were good or bad all i'm saying is that they were interesting political figures and if we study them as political figures you realize that this cliche of palaces and dancing girls and elephants and elephant love affairs uh, that goes away and you suddenly see them as politicians in a very interesting time deploying all kinds of fascinating strategies to retain their power and to retain their uh, their control over their territories and keeping the british at bay yeah it's 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 actually a very interesting sort of line uh, through like I, while while reading it i was like this may, this would make such a fascinating film where it's like all these i think you have eight chapters and it goes through a lot of royalty and and all of that it would be so interesting just to line through for a for a movie where it's like hey this is the painting and this is the story and then back to the painting and like that would be great yeah, yeah. anyway connecting to to what you just asked this is one of my questions which is a big what if okay uh, which is that i think you mentioned this quite a lot that towards the last 15 years like uh, nearing independence a lot of them sort of lost the plot and they were not being able to align together as one uh, and i think you mentioned repeatedly that if they had it would have been real trouble for the british way earlier so my big what if question to you is what could the maharajas have done differently i think one of the things you mentioned again is that they could have aligned with the congress earlier uh and sort of been more uh, open about their uh, nationalistic uh, this thing what is the what if scenario so this is two part question what is the what if scenario uh, in which they would have done, dealt with it better and the second part of the question is is there any sort of circumstances historically where they could have continued ruling like exactly. a, like yeah yeah their continuing ruling was actually on the table as late as the mid 1930s 
you know even gandhi ji yeah. gandhi ji was born in a princely state his father was yeah. a princely you know employee he was a diwan of one of these uh, petty kathiawar rajas so gandhi ji always had a certain kind of conservative respect for the rajas you know he he praised a number of them he called them things like raj rishi in the case of mysore he compared the travancore rani to lakshmi you know he was always very respectful to the princes and even the young socialists in the congress like jawaharlal nehru he used to caution them against uh taking congress activities into the princely states because to him that's equal to interfering in afghanistan or sri, or sri lanka you know he actually wrote that in one of his one of his writings so he always respected the princes even in the mid 1930s the british wanted to you know obviously there was pressure creeping up on the british to concede rights to the to the indians and the congress was really sort of ramping up their agitation so in the mid 1930s there was this government of india act it looked at india working as a kind of federation and there was place for the princes in that like the princely states would also be part of the federation and india would be governed in this loose kind of federation thing where there would be the british erstwhile british provinces where say congress etc would form uh, local governments elected governments and then the princely states would also send representatives etc to a central body that would make laws for the complete federation so the princes had a, a seat at the table as late as 1935 so you know thinking that oh, would they have continued is actually not so far fetched it was only in the final 10 years that the equation changed and one of the reasons it changed was world war 2 world war 2 meant that this federation and all was removed off the table uh, congress agitation ramped up and worst for the princes was that partition took place once partition took place there was no question of congress allowing a sort of loose federation they wanted a strong india that remained because there was a real fear that the rest of india would also break up if every province had this kind of you know autonomy then what was to say that india would survive as a country you know we had don't forget that we had secessionist movements in our country till the 1980s in punjab for example in tamil nadu before that a couple of decades before that so there was a real fear there was a real risk that is when the princes were told acha no more seat at the table we'll come with the carrot we'll come with the stick you choose which one you want uh, travancore maharaja chose the carrot nizam chose the stick he had a full on uh, military invasion of hyderabad in in 1948 you know bombs were dropped uh there were there was violence against uh, a lot of the people in hyderabad uh, a committee estimates that between some 27000 and 40000 people died in what india then very the indian government very coyly called police operation or police action you know it was not police it was the indian military that seized hyderabad so that's how the princes princes eventually left the scene even so they had a lot of cultural capital which is why they were paid these privy purses they were given certain privileges and honors but they then started diverting that money a lot of them started funding the anti congress opposition in the early uh, in the 50s and 60s you know the famous swatantra party for example uh, the janasangh which was the ancestor of the bjp one of the key found uh, funders was the was the rajmata of of gwalia you know so the princes had this money which government of india was paying them and they were using that to basically bait the government of india through the opposition So then Indira Gandhi decided that you know I'm not I don't like this so I'm going to just cut off the privy purses go back on the promise that was made to the princes and that's how the privy purses were ended she made it about socialism and about the people and so on but frankly the privy purses didn't cost that much you know the the say state of Travancore in 1949 had a revenue of 9 crores I'm among the top 5 in India for a province uh, and the privy purse you paid the raja was only 18 lakhs so you're getting territory worth 9 crores but you're only losing 18 lakhs in the process so it was a very good bargain for the indian government she got rid of it even though on the face of it for socialism in reality because the princes were interfering in politics and she wanted to draw a line over there the earlier question on you know the princes and the congress in the earlier times they had a long romance you know from the early from 1885 itself from the time the congress was established congress was initially what an elite movement of of english speaking men in suits uh, sitting you know meeting annually in in calcutta or bombay or madras and giving speeches so that was essentially where the congress began as they ramped up their ambitions funding them from the se- from behind the scenes were these rajas you know as early as 1887 rajas are told two years after congress was founded rajas are told by the british not to found the, not to fund the congress a decade later a so lot of them are still secretly funding the congress uh, in, in the 1920s lord curzon who had been viceroy of india complained that even now there were maharajas who were secretly paying money to the congress because it served their interests right they had the british putting pressure on them so they thought acha we support the congress because the congress is putting pressure on the british so it's like this triangular contest between the three and the rajas are also nicely playing this game not out of any altruistic reasons not because you know necessarily they believed in a greater idea of india or anything 
self interest they were political figures they thought saw themselves as legitimate so they decided why not we are going to preserve our power and our turf if that means a secret alliance with the congress so be it so you know they there were there was a lot of that a lot of them had involvements with revolutionaries you know so the savarkar brothers for example uh, who were supplying from europe bomb manuals into india etc they had uh, you know associates of theirs linked to the baroda palaces and maharaja's palace uh the baroda maharaja allowed a lot of anti british propaganda to be published in his state because you know he looked the other way he pretended he didn't know this was happening whereas in reality a lot of anti british stuff was being published there and then exported into other parts of of india from there and very cutely you know some of this was uh in, in one instance when the bombay police raided they found that these these this propaganda was being published under the title vegetable medicines so you look at the book and it looks like oh vegetable medicines and then you open the book and it turns out to be a bomb manual or something you know that was the kind of uh, the support they were giving uh, so you know and then a lot of maharajas were funding uh, educational organizations the deccan education society where which ran ferguson college in pune Ferguson was like a magnet for all, not only nationalists but also revolutionaries. So if you're funding a college that is known to be a hotbed of these young men, you know, sort of itching to do something violent against the Raj, you're obviously making a statement that acha look, you know, we're going to uh, be a bit anti-Raj here. So the Raja sort of played this constant double game, you know, on the face of it they're allies of the British, they'll praise the Viceroy, they'll sing a, you know, praises of Queen Victoria and all of that. But then behind the scenes they'll also do a lot of you know sort of twisted anti british uh, stuff as well yeah which is i mean i didn't even know about like uh, i think uh, the the resident and stuff like that which is like represented over the east india company uh, who who is essentially as you said like very dictatorial in the way they work and and by the way it is uh, i mean vegetable uh, medicine it, it can be a bomb because bombs do turn people into vegetables so there's there's some Ouch. there's some yeah. there's, <laughs> there's some <laughs> truth in that um yeah so okay uh, people watching uh, do give a like if you can so that uh, more people sort of tune in because uh, we are all slaves to algorithms nowadays um i'll just take a couple of chats that are popping in uh, on the thing uh, thanks a lot to subhashmit uh, uh, gupta for becoming a member appreciate it very much my friend um um ashwini says uh, hey manu uh, you're the coolest historian out there can you start your own podcast is that anything that you're planning at all not for now in theory yes because a number of people have said this thanks ashwini uh, you know so people keep saying this and i do have something that like that could become a podcast for example it's not in the realm of the impossible but all the same as of now no plans because there's there's a couple of writing projects to finish there's you know things to do so i don't want to like you know stretch myself too thin doing multiple things but yeah there's i'm not saying no but not in the immediate future Yeah, I mean, you're doing a thesis and all, man. I mean, there's a lot of work there. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. like it's a lot. Uh, okay, if uh, if anybody gives super chats, I will obviously give priority to those. So there's one question which is coming from Sagar. I think this is a question which a lot of people have asked uh, in, in like uh, private uh, discourse. Um, question for Manu: Most of the paintings of women of Kerala of 19th century have no blouse. Was wearing a blouse a caste thing in Kerala? Actually, nobody wore blouses. You know, men and women usually wore a mund around your waist. and that was it there was no covering of the torso that happened in kerala and that was not really a caste thing you know across the board uh, you have if you go to matanjari palace uh, the museum in in kerala and kochi you'll see a picture of the queen of kochi in 1930 and she's sitting gloriously topless this elderly lady just a mund around her her waist and nothing else that was the norm for a lot of orthodox people you know there was covering yourself up was considered unusual it was considered wrong it was considered in some cases indecent uh you know i hear uh, a member of the kodungallur palace uh, in kerala also told me about how when the young in somewhere in the you know 20s and 30s when the women of the palace went to the temple early in the morning the men would sit with torches in the in the portico uh according to one version of the story it was men trying to make sure these women did not wear blouses because not wearing blouses was a norm and blouses were this weird new thing that you know a, a, an indecent thing to do the other version is that you know it was the opposite uh, so i'm not sure which of these is the accurate story but the very fact that men sat with torches trying to make sure women were not wearing blouses or they were wearing blouses shows that it was still a very uncommon thing then i have a photograph of my own paternal great grandmother so upper caste women were allowed to wear a shawl as a kind of caste privilege but it was not meant to cover yourself it was not about modesty in courts you know it was about caste privilege so in my great grandmother's photograph she's got the shawl but it's put on one shoulder loosely so you can actually see her breasts they're exposed fully it's not about covering yourself it's just this 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 caste privilege you have 
that was denied to lower caste groups so you know in the 19th century there were these riots uh, over over the breast cloth as it were where converts lower caste hindu converts to christianity said they wanted to wear uh, cover themselves and the 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 ruler of travanco said fine you can wear blouses you can wear tunics whatever that's fine but you cannot wear the shawl of the upper caste hindu woman because that is a caste privilege only available to them you can cover yourself it was never about the breasts it was never about covering breasts it was about that caste privilege of the shawl and that not being open to everybody else so yeah in, normally in kerala for the longest time nobody wore blouses slowly with the coming of the british the coming of the victorians etc there was this feeling that women's bodies have to be dressed a certain way a new kind of gaze came in by which looked at women as a result of that women were told that acha you need to start covering up and the best instance of this is in the book there's a picture uh, in one of the i think chapter 4 or 5 where ravi varma paints the the wife of the raja of travanco and she's this lady from cochin and in cochin what what they used to do is that they would hold a cloth loosely against the breast if they were sitting for a painter if they were sitting for a cameraman because they knew that these images were for a new audience that also included white people so it was not like they wore blouses they just held a cloth loosely against the chest and then the moment the job is done you throw it away because you know you're back to normal yeah. there's also this wonderful anecdote about how the british resident who you referred to earlier uh you know told came to the maharaj of travancore's palace somewhere in the 1860s and said oh my god all your female staff are walking around topless this is not acceptable you know i am this white man i don't uh, i don't condone this so raja said okay fine you know all the women must henceforth wear blouses when working in the palace and it was such an unusual order and these women saw this as such a weird encroachment on their bodies that they would wear the blouse in the palace but the moment they got out of the gate the first thing they did was was to throw it off I I similarly heard a story about how the social reformer in Thrissur decided to take out a um, uh, a procession of women wearing blouses because social reform women have to cover themselves up yeah and the women all sort of wore blouses and sort of trotted out with him except that such a crowd of people gathered to see women in blouses oh my god we've never seen this <laughs> the women threw off their blouses and ran away again this could be an apocryphal story but it's a revealing story you know it's trying to tell yeah. you that uh, 100 years ago things were very different and uh, another favorite story i have is my own great grandmother maternal side she was in her middle aged uh, she must have been about 50 or late 40s when she got a blouse for the first time when her second daughter grew up got married and the bridegroom's family brought her a blouse as a present and she wore it and she sort of admired herself in front of the mirror and the story goes that when somebody said okay now come out let everybody see you in your new blouse uh, she said no 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 how can i go in front of my brothers and my husband wearing a blouse you know what will they think of me what an indecent you know a uh, modern thing to do i'm a traditional woman i will not wear blouses so today we have a misconception that it was only lower caste women who were barred uh the right to cover your breasts but if you look at the evidence you see that even to claim that women need to cover themselves for their dignity is a patriarchal argument it's a patriarchal gaze that says women's bodies have to be dressed a certain way for their dignity who said that who came up with that argument that if a woman is denied the blouse somehow it's a mark on her honor and then you look at the visual evidence you look at the evidence going back to the 17th century of travelers in kerala and they all talk about royalty other women etc walking around completely topless you know pietro della valle comes to the italian comes to the court of the zamorin of calicut around 1605 and he's stunned because two princesses enter and they're just wearing blue silk loin cloths no blouses or nothing uh, about the to cover their torso and you know he's sort of looking at them in wonder and they come and look at him in wonder because this old this man in the heat of kerala is dressed up and sort of fully covered up and they sort of touch his clothes and sort of comment among themselves as to what on earth he's Uh, why he's dressed this way and he's also looking at them saying why are these women all dressed uh, in in this topless mode so it's not a lower caste thing it was not covering breasts was not a caste thing as a standard nobody did but upper castes wore a shawl as a caste privilege and that caste privilege is where uh, disputes emerged and later people got confused and thought that you know it was about covering up the torso rather than about caste and the privilege of wearing the shawl it's it's so interesting like the the chat is ablaze with comments about this uh, about like like this is this is one of those i think uh, indian history things that everybody gets very fascinated by uh, because i mean the very concept of my blouse my rules um, gulshan singh has a weird weird question uh, i don't know if this is any any truth to that can you tell us about breast tax and one woman c- cut her nipple off Yeah. is there any truth to that is is what that's he asked a, that's a very interesting abbreviation but you no know, the story is so there is the story about 
uh, an Irava woman called Nangeli. And the general story you'll see going around on the internet is that, you know, lower caste women were not allowed to cover their breasts. And uh, the government used, of Travancore used to charge a tax on women if they wanted to cover their breasts. So there was a tax called Molakaram, which literally translates as breast tax. And women were, uh, if you wanted to cover yourself and maintain your dignity and honor, you had to pay this tax. Uh, some of the versions of the story go on to say that the tax was dependent on the dimensions of the breast. So the 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 more sort of, I don't know, well endowed you were, I suppose, uh, you know, the higher the tax, for example. But again, these are sort of titillating stories that are a sort yeah. of misreading of facts. To begin with, no, even the, the queens of Travancore at the time this, this supposedly happened did not wear blouses. So it was not a thing about covering uh, the breasts as such. There was a tax called Molakaram or breast tax, but it was a poll tax. So the government of Travancore in certain cases used to charge a certain tax on all lower caste communities. So for fishermen, there was a tax on fishing nets. There was a tax on moustache because you know only like high caste people could have those twirly moustaches. You couldn't twirl your moustache that you have anything too grand because you were a, an inferior being. You were not meant to look uh, aristocratic with, with, with your facial hair. So there was that kind of uh, violence. And there was a kind of capitation tax charged on lower caste communities in times of war or crisis, not on an everyday basis, generally as a kind of exceptional thing, which was in some places simply called talappanam, which means head tax. So each member of the family, there's a calculation made, and this is the head tax you have to pay. In some places, it was somehow divided as talakaram for men. And for distinguishing the rate that women paid, it was called molakaram, that is breast tax. It had nothing beyond the name to do with breasts. It had absolutely nothing to do with breasts. The story where this woman stands up and she does cut off her breast is her resisting the casteist tax itself. She's not, fire, she's not fighting to cover herself up because nobody covered themselves up in that time. It would have been the oddest thing to do in the early 19th century. Uh, what she was standing up to in the story is uh, this caste-based tax, which was levied on lower caste groups. You know, and, and there's plenty of evidence of this. It was abolished around 1812 by the British resident in Travancore called Colonel Munro. He's the one who abolished uh, Talapanam and all kinds of fishing taxes and all of those extra, uh, the bad caste-based taxes. And the interesting thing is this story that generally people see on the internet is about Nangeli, who was an Irava woman. But it also exists for a tribal community in the hills in, I think, Punyar, which is one of the fiefdoms within Travancore. So it's interesting that the same story of a woman cutting off her breast exists in a tribal group as well as among the Irava uh, community, which is to say that it... You know, somewhere it may have happened, but the story was accepted and sort of claimed by different communities to mark their own resistance to a caste-based tax. So the woman did not cut off her breast because she felt her breast deserved to be covered and it was an injustice when she was denied the right to wear a blouse or the blouse uh, could only be given if she, if she paid a tax. No, it was a caste-based tax. Uh, all lower caste people had to pay and she was standing up to that and that is the correct reading of this oral narrative that has come down in certain marginalized communities in Kerala. Wow, that's, uh, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, uh, there was also, I think, something you mentioned, it, it was just a passing line, but I'm just curious about, about just the, the, the general, I think, I think uh, when you were talking about, I, I, I'm going to butcher the name, so I'm not even going to try, but you said something about uh, that they were, they were absolutely fine with, ca uh, with caste-based economies. So like, I th like, what does, what does that imply? Is that, that, is it like how, how how stringently it was implemented back then or what 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 does that mean no so you know um, the you know, when we speak yeah. of the caste system it's not like somebody yeah. sat up and said okay these are the castes and this is how it's going to work there were now in in a, in a society like in kerala or the travan principally state and you see the same in udaipur for example in a different setting in fact let's take the udaipur example since we've spoken about travan now how does the maharaja in his traditional setting work he is no free agent. No political actor is a complete free agent. Even our current Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi, with all his like power in Parliament, is still not a free agent. You know, there there will be a lot of different interest groups. There'll be a lot of political arithmetic to do. And the same existed for a Raja as a custodian of a traditional society. So on the one hand, say Fateh Singh of, of Mewar in the late 19th century and early 20th century, he's a Rajput. Rajputs are the ruling elite of Rajputana and therefore he has an interest in maintaining that structure because his clan, his community, his caste group is the dominant caste group, even if numerically they're not dominant. At the same time, who are the actual peasants on the ground? They are the Jats 
and then there's uh, there's also tribal groups uh, who have you know their own uh, part in the political economy called the bhils so these are the two big other groups that are there on the ground and then of course there are smaller groups etc the raja has to firstly keep his chieftains in check his fellow rajput chieftains in check so that they don't encroach on his own power he also has to pay off the british and make sure the pressure from the british is manageable and doesn't get too much equally he has to make sure that people below him the peasants the tribal communities they are also kept in check one way this was done was through the caste order so there were clear limitations on what each caste was allowed what they were not uh, something as simple as dress why did dress matter because in a society of caste distinctions even from a distance when i look at you i should be able to tell your caste so the kind of ornaments you wear the way you tie your hair the kind of clothes you wear uh, in, in the kerala context for example even though we wear the munda around the waist depending on whether the how low the munda goes from below your knee and whether it's above the knee you can tell what the relative position of the person is the kind of metal with which your ornaments are made that determines your caste uh you know the, the kind of hairstyles you keep that determines your caste and this is so a lot of rajas felt especially the more orthodox ones that their job was not to dismantle any of this this had come down for centuries uh, uh you know their ancestors had presided over the system and to maintain order was to maintain the caste order where each element in the overall machine contribute something get something in return not equal but there is some kind of arrangement that's been made and we just have to make sure that the system continues if any one community grows stronger than it's meant to be or stronger than it historically was it upsets the other uh, you know carefully balanced pieces on the check on the on the, on the chessboard as well and that is why a lot of these rajas felt that their incentive really was in maintaining that status quo but all the same we can't overstate it either because what we do see is throughout indian history individuals may not be able to transcend castes but caste groups can sometimes move up and down in the caste order they can keep moving up if they suddenly say have access to land so in the in the book for example i speak of the pudukote estate the pudukote royal family were kallars kallar in malayalam as well literally translates as robber so they were considered the robber caste kings and the british class this community as a in quotes criminal tribe that is they are genetically prone to criminality but in the case of the colors from the 17th century onwards in that pudukote area of tamil nadu not only did they gain access to land they were able to use that to become kings they were able to create an aristocracy they were able to assert power and once you have power frankly even the brahmins will come into puja for you they were you become sponsors of temples you becomes protectors of temples technically in other parts of tamil nadu you are considered a criminal tribe but the same caste in pudukote with access to land access to economic resources access to brahmanical legitimacy you know once you become protectors of temples the brahmins are also happy to come and do your coronation rituals they sort of move up in the in the caste ladder uh, you know in in how do the rajputs emerge as a community that identity of the modern rajputs very much happened under islamic rule it did not exist 1000 years ago what we call rajput identity emerged slowly under islamic rule a kind of aristocracy coming together and becoming this endogamous caste group a lot of caste groups were created like this the marathas in maharashtra for example how did they differentiate themselves from the let's say the other uh, peasant castes or the other tilling classes there through military service through becoming warriors and fighters and administrative officers in the deccan sultanates and then they became a separate caste in their own right so castes could be formed and reformed and move up and down the caste ladder but anybody who is a king once you are in that position of power you have an incentive in maintaining that social order because you are the one in power you have you I mean, why would you want to upset the, the that very careful and precarious balance uh, unnecessarily so in in, in travancore there is this anecdote about how the travancore maharaja uh, you know he wants to impress the british by looking very modern yeah. and progressive so he establishes a college in the 1860s and then once he's laid the foundation stone he turns to his brother in law and mumbles i've just laid the foundation stone of anarchy why because now in a in your temple lower caste people can't come but in your progressive college everybody has access so anybody can get a degree once they have a degree they have a claim to a government job so does that mean a lower caste person who can't touch the raja cannot enter the palace now because of your progressive rules actually has access to education actually actually has access to power in a government office so then that creates resentments among the existing elites and they will feel oh my god you know this upstart has come from somewhere and he's claiming power so there's you know these rajas had to walk this very interesting tightrope between modernity and progress and and sort of change while also preserving as much as they could of the traditional order wow very interesting um 
Okay, just a lot of chats popping in. I'll just uh, hey, so fit and all, man. Nicely done. I've uh, yeah, good job. Um, okay, we have uh, Pratik Dubey. Yeah, <laughs> Pratik Dubey. Thanks a lot for your super chat. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to Pratik Dubey who also asked um, uh, which Indian king had the best leadership ideology. Is there? Is it even possible to say the best? Is it? Is it even conceivable to say best? I mean, I I would say there are some who are clearly leaders, and you know, some who are not very good at leading. Uh, you know, in in the latter category, in fact, I I mean, I, I shouldn't even count him. Frankly, there was this little boy who was the Maharaja of Kolhapur, and he was so unhappy. They had adopted him and put him on the throne, and then separated him from his friends, his family, and the British decided we will raise him to be a an ideal loyal uh, prince under the British Empire. Poor chap hated it, and a little boy was finally, you know, he at one point tried to run away from the British, dressed up as a bullock cart driver because he simply couldn't stand this tutelage. And poor chap was ultimately killed, uh, beaten in a scuffle by his own English, uh, let's say, guardian or, or watcher, and you know that's how he died. So that there, there were terrible, terrible cases like that. There were some rajas who simply couldn't uh, meet the pressure that the British placed on them, and they had no option but to practically let the British rule for them. But there were rajas who were very clearly firm, strong kind of leaders, and there were a lot of women also, in fact. So the, my favorite in the book is Sayajirao Gaikwad of Baroda. You know, he was also adopted from a, a farming family, uh, which, by the way, remember, like you know, these rajas were not always hereditary, you know, unbroken blue blood uh, kind of people. You know, their bloodlines often broke. They often had to adopt kids from from other lineages and other clan members, and those kids often came from very ordinary circumstances. So Sayajira Gaikwad was this illiterate twelve-year-old boy living near Nasik in Maharashtra, uh, you know, working on his father's and grandfather's fields. From there, he's plucked and put on the throne of Baroda after an interesting selection process. And he's also given these lectures on loyalty to the British. He's also given these, you know, these these sort of lessons on how to be a good prince and so on. And when he becomes to the throne at the age of eighteen in eighteen eighty-one or so, the British think, ah, okay, we've now shaped him to be a very very loyal prince. Does he prove to be a loyal prince? No. You know, from day one, he says, "I am a prince. I will behave like a prince. I am not your servant." You know, we are in a treaty relationship, so as far as the treaty allows you to interfere, I will let you interfere, but not beyond that. He is one of the biggest funders of the Congress Party. He is this man who goes abroad every now and then and meets revolutionary Shamji Krishna Varma, Madam Kama. You know, for an Indian Maharaja, he later says that, "Oh, these were just social courtesy visits or whatever." But for an Indian Raja to publicly meet a known enemy of the British Empire and receive them at tea is obviously making a statement. It was in his territories that bomb manuals and contraband material against the British was being printed. Uh, at one point, uh, the the Prince of Wales came on a tour to to India, and he was told that they'll be passing through Baroda, so you must be present in Baroda to receive them. And he said, "I'm not your servant to be around here when your prince is passing through." And when the prince came to Baroda, he went on a European holiday. Uh, you know, so he had this way of standing up to the British in different ways. Uh, he he attended Congress meetings. He gave speeches, and if you look at his collected speeches, you will not find any other prince who uses the word national, uh, national or nation in their speeches as much. You know, he's talking about national government, national culture, national education. He uses the word national so much that you know clearly the British are getting aggravated, and and. Finally, of course, his uh, you know after thirty years of sort of poking and prodding the British and needling them like this, in nineteen eleven, there's this famous Delhi Darbar where the King and Queen of England personally come to India for the first time and they're sitting there in their thrones, and all the rajas have been told you must come looking exotic, so you must wear these like uh, the British decorations you've got, all your diamonds and all of that, because the British are also putting up a show, right? They're showing off that look at us and our vast exotic empire. This man shows up in simple white clothes, wearing just a string of pearls, with a walking cane uh, in his hand. The story goes that you know that was put in the press was that as he walked up to the king, there were rules that you were supposed to bow this many times first to the king, then to the empress, and then without showing them your back, you had to walk backwards and then get off the stage. He was accused of walking up, sort of swiveling his cane in a very casual way. He was not wearing his diamonds or anything, and he completely ignored the empress, sort of tilted his head briefly towards the king. Turned around, showed him his back, and then walked off. Uh, before that, when the viceroy came and everybody sat up, uh, stood up, this gentleman apparently didn't, and then he sort of stretched his legs out and all that. So he was trying to be like, "I'm very cool. I'm above all this. I don't care about this." That was the kind of vibe he gave. In 1911, after 30 years, he was finally put in his place um, because of this Darbar incident. Uh, but even then, he continued to give his speeches. Even then, he continued to talk about 
about the future of India, as it were. He was the only prince I can think of who even said that if India is to become a nation, all these princely states will have to go. And this is a prince of one of the top five princely states in India. And before his death, also one of his final speeches was about this, saying that the British must, at least within the British Empire, give the same rights as, say, Canada to the Indian uh, people, where you can stay in the British Commonwealth, but you are self-governing. And, you know, he, he was always a very outspoken figure. So there, with a person like that, you see that despite efforts to train him psychologically, to make him loyal, he was able to counter that. Despite, despite efforts to put him in his place and treat him like a vassal, he always used his influence and his power to stand up to the British. So there, I suppose, you can see something of a leader. Although leadership is defined in different ways, right? they come in different shapes and sizes. There's no one uh, leadership formula. Okay, interesting. I'm just going to take a few chats that are popping in. Kunal Shah is very excited because who who Vadodara represent? Um, because this is a <laughs> this is a bit like the IPL right now. Um, and he also says that <clears throat> uh, Sayaji Rao University still keeps Vadodara literate along with uh, creating rail lines and kick-ass golf club. That's uh, he, okay, he also had a huge um, art collection. Sayaji Rao guy quite. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was the other uh, important thing he did. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it's, so related. To, um, okay. I'll just take two chats which have popped in, uh, which you've been here for a while. Um, Divya Warrior says, uh, finished reading Ivory Throne last week and love it, Manu. Uh, big smile. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for that. Okay. Um, I have a question which is related to what we are talking about, which is of course paintings, right? Uh, like at the end of the day, we are all matlabi people and we want to know how much they got paid. I think you briefly mentioned, at least till the point I got uh, through that, one of the, I think, European painters had got paid 12,000 rupees for, uh, had been paid 12,000 rupees at that time, I think in the 1830s, uh, to uh, for a commission painting, which, I mean, yeah. if you go by inflation, I think it's about uh, two and a half crores in current uh, income. Yeah, uh, to, be, to, be, yeah. to be clear, though, it yeah. wasn't one painting. It was a set of paintings that he did. Uh, uh, some of them are in yeah. the Kutra Malika Palace Museum in Trivandrum. Uh, yeah, but this was a time when the Rajas had an interest in these Western artists. Why? Because yeah. in a sense, having white people come and paint you and you extending patronage to white people, in a world where white people are rulers, in a world where white people are, are the dominant class, there was something about claiming that for your own prestige. You know, a lot of the Rajas, you know, they were, they were bullied often by the British resident in their courts. But a lot of them often argued for retaining the residents. There, there have been instances where the Rajas of Mysore, Travancore were told that we will, by the British, that we will withdraw the resident from your court. And the Rajas said, no, <laughs> we want the resident. Because if you didn't have a resident, you were lowered in prestige to Chotomoto states that did not have the honor of a direct line with the, with the governor general or with the governor of Madras or whoever. So to have the resident was also a status uh, sort of point. So there was that. Uh, with, with artists, of course, the Rajas had a lot of self-fashioning that they were doing. Uh, you know, one of the reasons Ravi Varma became popular was also because Ravi Varma was doing what white people was, were doing, but often better than them. And he was often able to do it by slightly Indianizing things. You know, so he often, uh, there was a man called Theodore Jensen who came and did a bunch of portraits when Ravi Varma was a young man of Kerala royalty. And you can see, Rupika Chavla studied these paintings and you can see that Theodore Jensen is so used to painting European faces that when he paints Indian faces, he inevitably Europeanizes them a little bit, almost subconsciously. He can't help it. You know, he can't do Indian features properly. There, Ravi Varma had an advantage. He was able to do Indian features well. He was able to claim what the West claimed as a very superior form of painting, academic realism or whatever. He was able to take it without being formally tutored in it. And he was able to get better and better at it. And that is why he was able to build up this reputation and all of that. And he gave the Rajas what they were looking for in a portrait as well. You know, even today, think of us in our own time. When people take pictures of themselves for Instagram and they take their selfies or whatever, we're all fashioning ourselves in a certain way, right? We are projecting the image we want the world to see of us. You know, it's not necessarily who we are on a daily basis. It's exactly how we want to be projected. Now, go back to the 19th century and think of this in political terms. When a Raja commissions a painting, he's not looking just for his likeness. He's not looking just for his, his face to be captured. He's making a statement. And it's the same for Rani's also. They're making a statement as to who they are. So every detail as to what kind of clothes you're wearing, what ornaments you're wearing, what medals you're wearing, the weapons you're carrying, uh, the, the background of your painting, the books that are, in the, are on the desk next to you, all of these were loaded with meaning and Ravi Varma was good at catering to this. So in, 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 in say Mysore, for example, 
the chamarajendra wadiyar had this very sort of look at me i'm an efficient modern day maharaja so i will celebrate the old dasara tradition but simultaneously with dasara i will also have an industrial exhibition because i am so modern i am so progressive like that's the image he wanted to show and if you look at both the portraits ravi varma did of him you there's this kind of restlessness in one the raja sitting in this armchair it's almost like he's about to get up and go back to work and the other one also he's standing with his hand on his hip very much a man of action that's the kind of image he wanted to portray uh, then you take the maharana of udaipur who ravi varma paints in the early 1900s Udaipur Maharana hated the British. He hated the English language. He hated anything to do with white people, and he hated the idea of progress in modern rule. Uh, when somebody said that, you know, why don't you build roads in your state? He said, my people have done for a thousand years with with dirt tracks and cart uh, sort of paths. Why should I bother with modern roads? If it existed well in the past, it can continue even to the future. So with, when Ravi Varma went there. the so ramharana wanted an image where he defies all these british expectations so no british medals no books no british furniture in fact like in old miniatures the maharana maharana stands with a shield in one hand a sword in one hand sort of glaring out at the viewer because he is using oil painting but he's preferring to stick to the ancestral tradition of painting rajput men in a certain way uh, not wearing these the british cape and not wearing the british medals that he's got you know uh, the story goes that when he got one of these british medals he said go and put it on the horse you know i don't want to wear it it's like a slave's collar why should i wear it uh, so you yeah. know each painting was about demonstrating who the person in the painting politically is and that's another reason why uh, ravi varma such a success and it wasn't just specific to him this has been the case with the royal portraiture in general you know in general throughout history royal portraits were even in as sculptures and images that are not paintings uh, even there you see it so you look at Krishna Deva Raya's bronze that he gave of himself and his wife, which is kept in Tirupati, you know that that is meant to represent a certain kind of ruler. Uh, you look at uh, you look at in the same region. You go down a few centuries and you go to the uh, the, the temple and you see this uh, the Madurai temple and you see Tirumala Nayaka's uh, you know stone sculpture that's over there. It's this nice pot-bellied man because by his time, if you look at uh, Sanjay Subramanian, Vaishnav Narayan, and David Shulman's uh, book called Symbols of Substance. they talk about how nayaka kingship was about consumption and about sort of flaunting your wealth and prosperity it was not necessarily about dharma and religion it was very much about this very materialistic universe so there the king had to be the spot bellied very contained sort of man not necessarily the the lean virile figure of krishna devaraya's bronze but a, a a man who's plump and well fed and content and prosperous so every royal image is a way of demonstrating something and i'll just end with one more anecdote which is in the chapter on my so my, my friend Caleb Simmons uh, you know i've used his research for this particular segment he talks about how the myso maharaja was toppled for 50 years and the british took over the state after a rebellion in myso by the veera shaivas or the lingayat community in those 50 years this king commissioned a lot of pictures and you know uh, sculptures of himself which were placed in temples which were dis- distributed and circulated in the state and in each of these he took different avatars so in one he will appear as a vaishnava in another he'll appear like a lingayat wearing the ishtalinga or you know posing like a lingayat because he's speaking to different subjects or different groups of his own subjects elites who matter within his kingdom and each image is crafted to uh, cater to one of these elites so no portrait was ever just about acha mujhe mera picture chahiye it was always yeah. about me wanting to project who i am as a political being to the viewer yeah it's almost like uh, i mean it's like choosing the painter was essentially for the rich was like choosing a filter on instagram now it's like hey i want to be projected as x and yeah. I, you know i love the thought of the restless king the man of action who has to project this image of himself as this uh, man of action even though for a painting he'd probably have to stay in that pose for quite some time so yeah. so the photograph of the evidence of him trying to get up and like show movement is is got to be hilarious but he's just like yeah this guy just had to stay in one place for a while the the, the great uh, advantage there was that you know photography had come in by then and often what yeah. was done was you know uh, instead of live sittings a photograph would be taken and sent to ravi varma and he would work uh, out of that photograph he oh, didn't enjoy yeah. it he preferred proper sittings which is what the udaipur maharana gave him uh, but yeah. uh, for a lot of other princes often it was based on on photographs and you can sort of tell a difference in quality between the two 
Okay, so you you mentioned this briefly about the transition between uh, East India Company and then uh, I think when the the royalty etc took over and uh, how Queen Victoria at the time was a little bit more empathetic to the people and she said that they need to un- unless they are able to rule themselves that's the only time they'll prosper etc etc and she was learning I think languages was Bengali or something or Sanskrit. No, she had to learn uh, Hindi or Urdu. She had a movie yeah, yeah. even in in uh, in London with her and after she died. Her, her her family burned all her correspondence with the Munshi because they were scandalized that there was such a there's a brown man who was so close to the queen that she wrote him personal letters. So, but you also mentioned that there was like art and uh, literature apparently that popped up of of Maharani Victoria, uh, which which I find quite quite interesting because uh, I, especially I think that was at the time where, in, where India was like hey independence and we need to rule ourselves etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, a what what were the most like sort of uh, I wouldn't say absurd, but rather the most sort of unique sort of uh, expressions of art toward her. And also, was there any sort of outcry or any opposition to any of this happening where it's like hey, uh, our sort of distant rulers or whatever else it is? You know, Queen Victoria was strangely very popular in the Indian Empire. And, you know, in yeah. the book I have, uh, it falls allies, I have this picture somewhere in the first chapter only of uh, Queen Victoria done by a North Indian artist somewhere in the early part yeah. of the 19th century where <laughs> she's she's shown breastfeeding her daughter. So you've got an exposed yeah. breast and it's, it's a, if you look at it, you think it's a caricature. You know, it looks nothing yeah. like Victoria, but it's meant to be yeah. Victoria Maharani with her daughter. And you can clearly see, I saw the faces are supposed to be white people's faces. You know, there's a kind of cherubic quality to the daughter, for example. But there's an exposed breast in this, uh, breastfeeding being yeah. done in this picture. Because this was a way of Indianizing the queen for an Indian audience, because she had been accepted by an Indian audience. And there is actually politics to that also. As you said, when Queen Victoria took over after the East India Company, there's a book by Miles Taylor, I think that's the name, uh, on Queen Victoria. And it's fascinating how she actually argued for her proclamation in 1858, when she took over, to concede a lot of almost equal status to her Indian subjects as her British subjects. It was British politicians who watered it down, watered it down, watered it down. Because they didn't want Indians to think that they were citizens who could claim to be citizens. They were subjects yeah. of the queen. They could not be citizens of the queen of, of the of the empire as, as such. So it's interesting that she had a kind of sympathy. And again, she was a woman at home. She had very little power. She was a constitutional monarch. So having this empire was something that gave her a sense of meaning. It gave her a sense of her own importance in the world. And she used to get a lot of correspondence from Indians. So much so that, and she used to like deal with these petitions from Indians with such energy and enthusiasm that finally the, the her government started censoring her post because she was just getting far too interested and invested in Indian affairs. And Indians used her proclamation, even though it was watered down, it promised to respect Indian religions, it promised to respect Indian rights, etc., etc. Indians used it for their own politics. So for instance, the first generation of nationalists, remember this is in India where 1857 armed rebellion has not worked. So they are a bit paranoid that any kind of armed process is not going to work. And at the slightest appearance of treason, at the slightest appearance of, you know, sort of wanting to push off the British by force or whatever, the British would shut you down. So one way the Congress party in the early years, you look at the proceedings of the Congress in its first uh, few years, all the Congress meetings began by pledging loyalty to the Queen. Because that was one way of getting rid of the accusation that this was an anti-national gathering. So if you begin by invoking the Queen and saying, oh my God, we are so loyal to the Queen, we love the Queen so much, the Queen is the best thing that happened to India, then you can use her and the proclamation and the promises she made in 1858 to hold up the British to their own standards. So it says that in at home you talk of democracy, you talk of rights, you have this great glorious history, why are you not conceding it to us? We are not even talking about us, we are talking about you and the values, you yourself, and your queen have stated on the record. We're holding it up and saying, look, live up to your values. So Queen Victoria was a very good instrument to use in that sense. And of course, her pictures were, you know, one of the things in the 19th century that people did was exchanging pictures of each other. So, you know, tomorrow, Saurabh, I come to your house to see you. And then we have a very formal meeting. This is a time when it's unlikely we'll meet again for 10 years because, you know, communication isn't easy. Transport isn't easy. So I give you a photo of me. You give me a photo of yourself and we keep it at our respective places. That's how a lot of this happened. And Queen Victoria obviously never came to India. So a lot of Indian rulers used to have portraits made of themselves and sent to Victoria. And she would similarly send her portrait to people she was impressed with. It could be photographs, it could be paintings, whatever. Her paintings appeared in all kinds of interesting places. So in, I think, Ramnad during the Navratri celebrations at one point, 
I think Queen Victoria's, so you have the Navratri celebrations, you have the ruler, but you also have Queen Victoria's portrait kept there because she's also the omnipresent sovereign or the queen empress who has to be part of everything, including Hindu yeah. rituals in this particular instance. So this portraiture, so Indianizing Victoria served Indians. So even, uh, you know, uh, Raja Haji Harish Chandra, for example, who is considered among the early nationalists, the man who... Um, who helped develop modern day Hindi in the late 19th century. He wrote very fine things about Queen Victoria because, you know, they were, they, she was somebody they respected. And I think she also had this kind of maternal vibe. So people thought, okay, she's the Amma of the empire. So there was a kind of uh, respect that was given to her. But of course, there was a, a limitation on that. After her time, successive rulers never managed to claim the same kind of influence. And Indian politics also became much more forthright. Tilak, etc. came and they said, why do we even bother with this queen? Get rid of her. We talk yeah. about ourselves. We have our own heroes. We have Shivaji. Why should we Why should we draw any kind of uh, value from Queen Victoria when we have our own heroes to focus on? So yeah, that's uh, it's an interesting way in which Queen Victoria was Indianized for Indian politics, but also in Indian images and in Indian minds. And so I saw the painting, the, the one of her breastfeeding. And I, 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 yeah, I'm glad you said it was character. And you said, I think it's an unknown painter. Because I saw it and uh, I was like, this is weird. And I was at my doctor's clinic where I was like, I was on my Kindle zooming in to see what the hell was happening in this portrait. But people were like, this guy's a little weird. Um, <laughs> also, enjoy the very thought of people exchanging photographs way back then because you know that some of those photographs definitely got sticky at some stage. Um, <laughs> well, one of the greatest memory. photographers of the age was Ram Singh of Jaipur. You know, I briefly cover yeah. him in the book just in passing. And, you know, he was a great photographer. He took a lot of self-portraits, including at least one picture in a very naughty pose to the lady, uh, you know, but also him as a Vaishnava, uh, him as a Shaivite, uh, you know, sort of figure, because he was a staunch uh, Shaivite. Uh, him in court dress, him, you know, in, in various other kinds of uh, attitudes and poses and so on. And he also is famous for first photographing the women of the harem. So the British always cast the harem as this kind of seedy, shady place where women are just sort of, you know, lying unhappy because they're all sort of pledged to this one um, uh, one prince who who barely come once a year to see them because he has so many wives to cater to. Or it's a place where women are plotting and intriguing and it's sort of like this dark corner of the palace. But in reality, the, the pictures Ram Singh has taken of his harem women, you don't see that. You see very sort of interesting women in interesting clothes and in interesting poses. It's possible he made them pose, but there's this sort of demeanor on their face which can't come unnaturally. You know, you can pose a person physically, but their facial attitude sometimes shows great confidence, great resolve, great personality, completely smashing the stereotype of the harem that the British circulated. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, th 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 those photos also, like some of those old ones, especially when you see in a museum and all, you're like, oh, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. Okay, we have, uh, I think, Akhil Pishorodi says that uh, Victoria hated breastfeeding. She had wet nurses, so yes. it's not Victoria in the portrait. I know, I know. She uh, hated being, she hated pregnancy itself. And anyway, it, yeah. uh, to, to be clear, by the way, this portrait isn't one she actually posed for. This is what yeah. an Indian artist imagined her to be, this very Amma-like figure. You know, they knew Queen yeah. Victoria had had a daughter, so this was one way of showing their loyalty and celebrating the event of her daughter's birth, by showing a breastfeeding white woman uh, with her yeah. infant child. Uh, it was actually not Victoria. Victoria would have been quite scandalized if she ever saw that picture. Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay, we have a, uh, we're going to go on for 10 minutes more. If anybody wants to comment, uh, Super Chats will help most because I'll give those priority. Um, okay, there is, okay, Sagar asked this question. Um, thanks for the Super Chat, Sagar. He says, how big of a role did, does uh, Ravi Varma's sibling, Raja Raja Varma, play in Indian painting history? Was he a sibling or is, uh, uh, he wasn't a sibling, right? Both, both. Sibling? In fact, the, the yeah. problem with, uh, with a lot of Kerala families is that you have very limited names to choose from. So Ravi Varma's right. wife's name was Mahaprabha, his mother-in-law was Mahaprabha, and his daughter was also Mahaprabha. It's the most yeah. problematic thing for a biographer to talk about because nobody saw which Mahaprabha you're talking about <laughs> at any given moment because they're all like three generations with the same name. In his yeah. case, his brother Raja Raja Varma was 12 years younger than him. Yes, he had a major role in Ravi Varma's career. In fact, Ravi Varma was in some sense the brand. He was the face, he was the charismatic leader of the, of the brand. But Raja Raja was the one who worked on a lot of his paintings. Even something like Ravi Varma's famous uh, Damayanti with the swan. There's a, you know, you have in Raja Raja Varma's diary, you see a bit where Raja Raja says, oh, today I'm working on the pillar in that painting. So you're like, wow, he was involved in that painting also. Yeah. Towards, the, towards his 40s, Raja Raja Varma started signing the paintings with his brother, sort of staking claim as an equal. Unfortunately, he died uh, soon after. He died in 1905, January 1905. So before he could sign more works with his brother and claim his equal share in, 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 in the business, 
he passed away so the world sort of celebrates ravi varma whereas in reality ravi varma had a lot of help from his brother he was always present in in practically everything ravi varma did after 1878 Okay, I have one more question, and then we should end uh, because we've gone on for an hour. I mean, you've gone on for an hour because you know so many things. I'm just interjecting with my dumb jokes in the middle. Okay, I had a question, which is that I think you mentioned um, again. I'm going to butcher the names. Uh, That's okay. Uh, Swati Tirumal. Yeah. Tirumal. Yeah. So you said that he uh, he went through all this depression, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and he was um, there was also allegations that when he died in his thirties. there were allegations that he may have been poisoned uh, so my question is about like just i mean fascinated by assassination attempts and all of that kind of stuff back then because i'm sure it existed uh, what is the either the most unique method that anybody's employed to do that and it could be just based on rumor and and uh, everything else and also is there any sort of history of of somebody attempting and uh, just failing at it just completely failing at it Uh, i either of those i'll uh, yeah you know there's a uh, one of the maharajas of baroda called malhar rao uh, was in my opinion unjustly thrown off from the throne by the british on the charge that he had tried to uh, poison the british resident uh, so by the way the resident even though the resident is a bit of a bully there were ways to manipulate the resident because a lot of the residents couldn't keep it in the pants so they had illegitimate children and secret wives and the rajas knew about this and they would use it against the resident in in trivandrum for example there was a resident cotton and there's still in malayalam a saying in the in the city that metal cotton and does your mattress have cotton in it which is a way of saying has cotton been to see your wife uh, you know yeah. because he was apparently very promiscuous so promiscuous that when the maharani came to power she basically got him married immediately and she said till you get married i cannot receive you at my court because uh, i will not meet a single man of this reputation uh, yeah. so anyway malhar rao uh, did not get along with his resident and the resident claimed that he had been uh the he, the malara tried to poison him using diamond dust and arsenic so you create a kind of compound of diamond dust and arsenic and put it in the sharbat that this man has after his morning walk and he drinks the sharbat and then notices a part of the sharbat and notices this residue at the bottom and then it's sent for testing or whatever and turns out to be arsenic mixed with some other things and so that's one uh, way of killing somebody There what an expensive also... ways to use diamond dust to attack you so that's quite expensive like uh, as as a general rule but yes please go ahead huh but you are talking about princes right so i suppose yeah, diamond yeah, dust would not be all that tough to to come by but yeah. to be clear malhar rao actually wasn't convicted in that case which meant the british right. actually just got rid of him because they were looking to get get rid of him in one way or the other and this was just an excuse uh, so that was a unfortunate instance uh, of a raja being deprived of his throne even though he was not a good raja by any stretch huh? he was quite a bad man used to pick women off the streets and all that so textbook villain uh, but even so legally speaking they had no right to divest him of power there was i mean there are funny stories in indian history of how rulers tried to counter this threat of poison one simple means was always watch your cook and make sure your cook tastes what you eat before you eat it so if something happens to your cook you know then you're not going to eat it. uh the other thing was there's a story of mahmud begada the sultan of gujarat a few centuries ago and the uh, the story that the europeans put out and they were very fascinated by this was that apparently the sultan's mother fearing that he might be done away with poison used to feed him small doses of poison from his childhood to sort of improve his immunity completely apocryphal i'm sure and the story goes that by the end of it he was so poisonous that if he wanted to kill his nobles he just had to spit on their face and they would die because <laughs> his saliva was poison uh no no woman who spent an evening with him would survive because his semen was poisonous his sweat was poisonous this is an exaggeration but i would yeah. put it beyond some protective mother experimenting with sort of safer poisons to see if you know her son builds up a a capacity to withstand a reasonable quantity yeah. of poison without dying yeah. so there's there's that much as possible but i think poison saliva and poison breath and poison semen sounds a bit much so you know poison yeah. was yeah always present and but more than poison you know it was this whole question of succession and who's a legitimate heir who's not a legitimate heir these questions of legitimacy are fascinating because they you know the rajas often adopted because they didn't have biological children or if they had biological children all of them were through concubines and you know lower wives rather than the chief important wives of the right caste so there were issues like that and that uh, often opens up interesting stories in the 18th century the maratha queen tarabai fascinating character woman of such spirit and personality you know she had a say in politics in the early 1700s then she was removed from the scene for some 30 40 years and then after that the raja who essentially was her rival for the longest time 
he doesn't have an heir so she says oh you know secretly my son had a child years ago and i secretly hid the child away with a, a secret family and then she sort of brings this boy up and says okay this is your heir the boy is enthroned as ruler as as, as the king of the marathas and then she expects to control him as a kind of remote control like she expects to be the real power behind the throne behind this boy she's installed he turns out to enjoy power himself and he says no i'm not going to share power with you at which moment she immediately turns around and says no no he was just some bard i picked off the street he has nothing to do with me <laughs> he has nothing to do with the royal family so manipulating succession through pretenders claimants all of this was the norm uh, and a lot of families you'll find that you know long lost sons coming back even in the mughal empire you know uh one of aurangzeb's brother disappeared into bengal and i think there were cases where random people showed up every now and then claiming to be that long lost prince and you know this would become right. serious political problems because you have a huge empire right so there are people in your empire who are unhappy and this pretender becomes a focal point for loyalty and he's able to marshal troops so actual rebellions have emerged from people who actually have nothing to do with the royal family simply claiming yeah. to be uh, members of the royal family in the book i i have this case from mysore in the in the 1820s where this when the mysore uh, kingdom had taken the kingdom of kelari uh, and and then uh, some random guy through a swami ji happened to chance on the on the some heirlooms of the of the erstwhile royal family that went away some 30 40 years ago and he just pretends to be a descendant based on that oh, and he God. actually helps foment a rebellion simply because he's got the right emblems with him which prove in courts that he is a descendant and he becomes the a focal point for rebellion so yeah that's another yeah, long winded answer yeah, dna testing and 3d printing could have resolved so many of these problems uh, well dna testing uh, apparently would uh, put even queen victoria in trouble there are stories about <laughs> queen victoria's <yeah>. paternity <laughs> but we will not discuss that here yeah uh okay uh, i'll just take a few more chats and i have one more question which is coming in miss listening to manu at college because of the pandemic love this team and your insta stories are hilarious you can fo- follow manu at what coconut w a t coconut um yes. and people are very fascinated by the the poisoned uh, uh, prince and uh, akil says akthu dead <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then uh, shovik bakchi says please don't give ideas to my mom please <laughs> and uh, kunal shah uh, ensures that i don't get sponsorship from vimal by saying ladies and gentlemen that's how we get uh, we get women and mm-hmm. i like the conversations that are happening between people where so uh, suvidha says why so much uh, in infertility infertility oh i, I read mm-hmm. that as infidelity but infertility uh, in the royal families and then somebody replies uh, uh, abin jacob says uh, suvidha too much drunkards which is all all plausible <laughs> I mean, they okay, they like uh, to put down the curses and so on, but yeah, I think sometimes oh, the reasons yeah. are more mundane than curses, divine curses. In fact, divine curses. Yeah. You know, again, I know we're going over time, but uh, yeah. the the British at one point insisted that all rajas must have biological heirs born of their own loins, otherwise adopted heirs would not be allowed, and the British would take the kingdom. The famous doctrine of right. lapse. And um, the Mysore Maharaja did not have legitimate heirs. He had sons, but they were not legitimate, uh, and he was desperate to somehow keep his kingdom and prevent it from falling into British hands. so he said oh i'm going to have to adopt an heir now in the mysore royal family it was not a mainstream tradition but there was this one story that there was a curse on the family that uh, you know yeah. uh, every two generations they would cease to have heirs and the king now as caleb simmons shows brought this legend into the center of the royal narrative and brates basically tried to argue that look my not having heirs has nothing to do with fertility or whatever it is divinely ordained which means the british can't deny me adoption because god himself yeah. i mean in the form of this curse has ensured that every two generations we have to adopt it is a divinely mandated rule that we have to adopt so there are interesting strategies by which you know the british try to even use this this whole question of infertility uh, and 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 how the rajas try to counter that pressure yeah it's it's such a interesting thing where i think you you mentioned that entire uh, i think travan corals itself where, they, where he just said that uh, i've been ordained by god and so we are we are ruled, like i'm i'm basically this thing of god and so every time they uh, i mean that's a infallible argument at, at at that point of time or even probably yeah many rajas claim to be god servants on earth which meant that anything you did is is kosher because ultimately you represent god correct which is yeah uh, okay well, let's let's get all let's get all bollywood in in this sense okay this is the last thing i'd like to ask you uh, because uh, a lot of biopics being made all of them starring akshay mm-hmm. very disappointed again to repeat that he's not playing with hali raj and that mm-hmm. went to tapsi pan when not akshay kumar severely disappointed okay um so this is a two part question from chats i've been keeping this at bay uh, shovik bakchi says manu have you ever been approached by bollywood for consultation in any period drama and then to follow up 
uh, Dexter, who says which historical Bollywood movie is most accurate. I think let's extend that to not only Bollywood, just like let's just say Indian movie, because I think like it's relatively likely that uh, across the country they've been far better uh, sort of yeah mo- more realistic movies being made. Yeah. Yeah, I have been approached, but I have not taken up any of these uh, consultation things yet because it also depends on who's approaching you. I mean, if you're going to make some kind of over-the-top thing, uh, why be part of something like that? Because you know it's going to be butchered, uh, you know, no matter what you say. Because ultimately, you say all this, you give all this information, then they say, but you know, this won't work on the audience, so we have to make it like sexify it and uh, do all kinds of things. So so far, I haven't been, I haven't accepted any of these these consultation offers. Uh, what was the second part again? Uh, what is the most realistic? Um, uh, he said ah, Bollywood uh, film, but I'm saying yeah, let's Bollywood, just make, extend it to him. Yeah, let's just I can't extend think it to of India. Any. I can't think of any. Yeah. I can think of very many bad ones, but I can't think of anything that passes uh, muster. Uh, in terms of other parts of India, you know, Shatranj K. Khiradi, I think, is considered oh. to be relatively interesting and well done. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. there is, of course, it, it's based on on a, on a fictionalization of things. But even so, like the context is built up in in a, in a much more interesting and authentic way without this over the topness. Um, in in Kerala, it's not history as such, but there is this um, old uh, ballad called um, the, about Kuthuram Veet Lunyar and so on. Vadakan Veera Gatha, it's called, and that was done as a Manu Mamuti film in the 80s with an interesting twist at the end. And I like that. I don't think any other Malayalam films since have managed to. Uh, do justice. That's not history per se. It's again an oral narrative. It's a. It's almost legendary. It, it has some historical roots, but you know, it sort of come down orally over 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 the centuries. That's I think done in a nice way. I, I enjoyed watching that film many many years ago, but since then, no, I can't think of too many that have uh, done a good job with history, because we immediately fall into these nationalistic dialogues. We immediately fall into either this person is so glorious they're not human. Or they're so yeah. villainous that they are not human. Like nobody is human in period dramas and period films made in India because we assume that all like people in the past somehow just you know it's that basic thing, right? They'll have this like thing they're wearing and it's falling over one arm like this and they're walking around always so stiffly. Nobody walked like that, you know. Nobody <laughs> walked like that. Kings also had their darbar clothes for formal occasions. On everyday occasions, they dressed like normal people. Maybe they'll add one ornament or something to mark distinction or, or, or an ornamented cap or something, but nothing beyond that. People did not walk around stiffly like that. That Kingship was not being stiff. <laughs> kingship was, in fact, being flexible with a lot of things. Your morals, your politics, everything. And that flexibility reflected in their persons as well. Yeah, it's it, that's such an interesting point because I think even when I was watching Jodha Akbar and all, I'm like, dude, it's like 40 degrees outside. Why are they dressed so, like, I mean, this is going to be, like, I was feeling bad for the act. In my head, like, is this how they dressed? Um, but just by the way, to anybody who's not seen Shatranj Ke Khiladi yet, it's like one of my favorite films. It's also very, very funny. And I think um, you can find so, it on YouTube these days. It's very easy to find, yeah, I believe. Yeah. Pretty sure. Just just go watch it and just fantastic acting and everything else. Um, I think Akhil says that uh, the movie you mentioned won for uh, national awards yeah, including best yeah. actor for Mambuti. So. Yeah, but that's I think also because of that interesting twist at the end. They also reinterpreted that that, that story in a very nice way. Uh, so yeah. sort of the, the 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 villain becomes the anti-hero rather than the villain villain. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that is there's a lot there. Uh, Manu, thanks so much for your time. Is there anything I, I just like to say? Uh, your book uh, False Allies is available on Kindle for just 130 rupees, uh, and uh, I that's I also bought it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you have access, please go ahead and uh, check it out on on the Kindle. It's a very very interesting read. I've as I said, read about 80 odd pages. We'll finish it in this week. Um, anything else you'd like to plug, Manu? Anything else? No, no, I'm not going to plug anything. But thank you for having me, and and again, thank you for wearing that very colorful T-shirt. I have a very like even when you're talking, I was like, wow, where do I, where does one get one of these? Not that I can ever carry it off, but even so. Uh, I, so this was basically bought because I wanted to show uh, teach my children the planets. So I just ah. found a T-shirt which is like all about the planets. Even though I, I doubt any of these are authentic, and there's a lot of Saturns going around. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, just a couple of things I'd like to plug. Uh, if you're watching this later on and you want to support the show, feel free. There's a new thing on YouTube where you can do that. Uh, and follow Manu everywhere. Uh, WAT Coconut is on Instagram and on Twitter. And I have a few things to plug. I have a show coming up uh, this weekend. I'm going to be in Bangalore. Uh, early bird tickets are all sold out. Uh, two shows, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, then we are in Kochi, Vizag, Mumbai, Bhuvaneshwar and Calcutta. Again, some early bird tickets are left there. So please go get them. Uh, so Pant.com and subscribe to this channel. We, I might do one extra episode this week as well. Either on Friday or Sunday. I'm not sure. 
So just keep following uh, the YouTube communities board to figure out all of that stuff. And thanks to everybody who kept uh, popping in. Really appreciate all of your time. And Manu, thanks a lot for coming back. Thank I you. really appreciate thanks it. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. Super. Take care of yourself, everybody. Love you all. Marry me. Goodbye. Ending broadcast now.